It's uh, it's been a rough week um, for a lot of people, you know, with what's what's transpired in the U.S. this past week and their capital and and even in Ontario here with all the the talk of of longer lockdowns and even potential harsher lockdowns and order to, to deal with the, the covid virus that we're all going through. Uh, but in many ways, it's is very appropriate for what we want to talk about this morning. We want to we want to continue where we left off last time, which is now dealing with this bitterness. Last time we were we started talking about bitterness and, and the damage really it does to our own souls, to our own hearts, and how it it causes us to miss out on the grace of God. It it causes us to experience trouble in our own lives and even defiling those around us. The, the mental and, and physical side effects of bitterness and how it, how it eats away at us. You know, we really, we really need an answer to, to get rid of that bitterness for our own sake. And, and we used an illustration last time of, of living life in a panic room. As we kind of used the illustration of our hearts as being like a house. And when, when people violate those boundaries of the house, when they, when they hurt us, when they abuse us and they, they, they sin against us, it's like they break into that house and they, they destroy things or they steal things from us. And, and we talked about different ways to handle it. And, and one being is this idea that we, we, we construct these boundaries that are so thick and so, so, um, uh, send people uh, away from us trying to protect our heart. But it ends up causing us more hurt and more damage because although we're, we're, we're protected somewhat in that panic room and that behind those walls of protection, they become our prison. And, and we don't get to receive or experience any kind of love, any kind of life from other people. And so we're really much, very much left out on our own at that point. And, and so we, we need an answer to deal with those hurts so that we can, we can come out of that panic room and experience freedom. And that answer is forgiveness. And, and the thing about forgiveness is forgiveness is not a question of if you'll have to do it as much as it is as when you have to do it. And so we need to understand that forgiveness is a life skill. It's something we need to learn how to do and how to do properly. And, and, and fortunately, Father's Word speaks to that. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. So the passage we're going to look at is, again, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 to 32. So read along with me if you've got, got, it on, got your Bible with you. It'll be on screen. But it says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Let's pray. Father, as we, as we talk about something so precious and so tender... I, I pray that that we would hear from you, that we would we would discover the freedom that you're inviting us into. And that as our enemy tries to sow division and, and so kind of strife right now in our minds to to really hide this, this freedom that you're offering us, Lord Jesus, I, I pray that you would you would direct our thoughts and our minds as we trust in you. And that today would be a special time. A time where we get to discover um, what you've done so that we can, we don't have to carry this bitterness anymore. In your name we pray, amen. Well, to start, I thought we would, we would just start with a working definition of what forgiveness is. And then we just kind of put it out there on the table and then spend the rest of this morning exploring it and trying to understand what it means. So, so here's my definition of what forgiveness is. I, I define it this way. Forgiveness is an act of my will, independent of my emotions, meaning it, it, it's not based on what I feel, where I choose, so there's an act of my will, I choose to release the debt that another owes me thereby making myself available to receive from Jesus what was taken from me. So that's, that's going to be our definition of forgiveness. And now we're going to sort of unpack that the rest of this morning. But, but let's start with the, the word forgive in, in, just in a general sense. In, the, in, the word, in, in Greek, the word forgive literally means to send away. And in fact, it's actually translated that to, to leave or to send away in some parts in Scripture. But in the context of forgiveness, we might think of it as to, to send away a debt or to, to release another from the debt they owe me, meaning or resulting that they would owe me nothing. 
That's essentially what forgiveness is. So to, to try to explore this topic this morning or, and understand it, I thought, I thought we would tackle it by looking at the five W's and the one H. Remember learning that in school? It's sort of like the, the bedrock of any kind of investigation or, or journalism where you ask five questions, all begin with the, word, the, the letter W and the one H. The question being who, what, where, when, why, and H being how, right? And that how being, I think, is, is really the most important question uh, uh, when it comes to forgiveness. So we're going to try to explore those five W's. So let's start with the one, one W, why. We'll start with that one first. Why we forgive. And, and we spent some time exploring it last week. So if you want, you can, you know, watch that video later on again. But, but the answer why is because the bitterness ultimately is destroying you and I. It, it's ultimately causing havoc within our, within our own hearts, within our own relationships, with our own bodies. And, and so forgiveness is really so that we could experience freedom. And that's really what it comes down to. And I think we need to understand it because when I talk to people about forgiveness, you know, there's all kinds of different objections. Objections about not why they can't forgive because we can, but why we won't forgive. And that's a, that's an important distinction that because of Jesus living in us, we can do it. The question is, will we or not? And so here are some of the, the common objections that I've heard or reasons that I've heard about why people aren't willing to forgive. And the first one is they, they say it's, it's not fair. It, it's not fair for me to forgive that person for what they did to me. And, and, and the reality is, is you're right. It's, it's not fair. It's not that, that what they've done to you, how they've offended you isn't right. It's not appropriate. And, and that they, they ought to, in some ways, uh, not be forgiven. They don't deserve that forgiveness. But, but again, keep in mind that forgiveness, number one, is for you. It set you free. But number two, was it fair that you and I were forgiven? And, and the answer is, is that it's not fair that we were forgiven. I mean, we ought to have paid for our own sins as well, and yet we didn't. And, and so the same thing applies in the case of other people. This was, this was well answered by Jesus in, in Matthew chapter 18. With a, with a parable that is commonly known as the parable of two debtors. So let's kind of set the scene a little bit here. It was, it was a time where Jesus was talking with the disciples and, and Peter asked Jesus the question, how many times should I forgive someone else? Is seven times enough? And he probably picked seven because, you know, seven is often seen as the, uh, uh, um, as this perfect number, right? And, and the number of perfection. And, and Peter thought, you know, if I forgive him seven times, that's great. And then on the eighth time, I don't, I don't need to. And you remember Jesus' answer was, was seven t- 70 times seven. And, and I don't believe Jesus meant, you know, 490 times. So, you know, keep a chart, you know, 491, then cut them loose. I think what Jesus was saying was, was we keep forgiving over and over and over again. And to illustrate that point, he now tells this parable. Now, the thing about a parable, we have to remember, is that a parable is told for for one reason, to to tell, to explain one point. And I think that's important for us to recognize because often what can happen is is someone will take a parable and they'll they'll come away with 15 or 20 different main main points from that parable. And and it's not that those parables can't speak to those things, but you can get yourself into a lot of trouble when you try to, to squeeze too much out of what the parable is meant to be. And so a parable is being told for one purpose in particular. And so we're going to see that as we go. But the parable Jesus tells is of a king and two different servants. And the first servant he speaks of uh, owes this king 10,000 talents worth of debt. And the king decides to call in his debts. And so he, he pulls this one slave in front of him and says, you now owe me these 10,000 talents. Now, to kind of put that in perspective, because, you know, we don't have the, that talent currency anymore. But 10,000 talents then would be the equivalent of about just over $10 billion today. All right. So not the kind of money that you're going to find, you know, in between the cushions of your couch, basically. It's an enormous debt of a of a servant, of a slave, of, of a common laborer, essentially. So it's clearly well beyond his means. I, I kind of wonder what did this guy do to get into that kind of debt? But that's not point of the story, right? Because the parable's got a different point to it. But basically, the king says, you owe me now over $10 billion. 
And and the slave, the servant, rightly says, I I I can't afford that. I I don't have the money, but give me time. Yeah, right. Like like you know, within three years, suddenly you're going to come into that kind of money. Like there's there's no point giving you time. But he's desperate. He's completely desperate for the king. And Jesus says the king, being moved by compassion, and and don't miss that that what <clears throat> what moved the king was not not something that this this servant saying or doing per se it's that the compassion that the king feels for this man and so moved by compassion the king Jesus says forgives the man's debt he sent it away so this this man now doesn't owe anything he's completely free and and so you know you know you think about that now that that this guy, he, he, he's been let, let off the hook of this enormous 10 plus billion dollar debt. And he's walking out of there and he happens to come across one of his friends. And, and Jesus says his friend here, <clears throat> another common laborer, he owes this man a hundred denarii, which would be just under $30,000 by today's standards. So not, not nothing, but but a reasonable amount, something that could be paid off. But this man says, you owe me now this $30,000, pay me. And, and the man says, I, I, I don't have the money, but give me time. Everything basically this other guy said to the king, except his response is to throw this man in debtor's prison. Debtor's prison back then was you could, you could charge and imprison a man where he'd go off to a labor camp and he would work off his debt. And, and that's how this person would get his money. Well, word got back to the king that this is what happened, that he was forgiven of 10 plus billion dollars, but he coun't forgive his friend of $30,000. And, and so the king, he, he pulls the man in front of him and says, what, what are you doing? How could you, how could you do this? How could you imprison this man? And then he says in verse 33, the point of the parable. Remember, we said that a parable is told for one purpose. The purpose being here that Jesus is trying to answer the question of how many times we forgive someone else. And so verse 33, he says, the king says to this, this servant, should you not also have mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? You see, what Jesus is saying is that, that we forgive because you and I have been forgiven. See, when we, when we put ourselves in this parable, Jesus is the king, but you and I are the debtor with the 10 billion plus worth of debt. With the sin that we've committed against God and everyone else in this world, that, that is well beyond anything we can pay. It's beyond our means. And God's forgiven us. And now, now there's other people and they've offended us. They've sinned against us. But their debt is is not the same debt as what we owed God. And so <clears throat> for us to not forgive others after we've been forgiven, it doesn't make sense. And so Jesus tells in the parable here that, that this first servant, he ends up being handed over to the torturer. Now, please understand, this isn't about your salvation. Some have taught if you don't forgive, then, then you won't be forgiven and you're going to lose your salvation and that, that just puts us into a workspace salvation and, and righteousness, and that's not the case. In, in fact, when Jesus would talk about hell, he would not talk about it in a tortured sense. He would talk about it where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth and utter darkness and, and that kind of language. Here, when he's talking about the torturer, he's talking about bitterness. Because essentially, that, that's what bitterness is doing. is <clears throat> It's torturing our own soul, our own heart, more than, more than anything else. And so you're right, it's, it's not fair, but it's not fair that we were forgiven either. And so we forgive because we've been forgiven. All right, the, the, the next reason that I've heard often is, is to not forgive. Well, well, they're not sorry. That I'm, <clears throat> I'm waiting for them to be sorry. I'm waiting for them to, to, to come to me, to show repentance, to show remorse for what they did, and then, then I'll forgive them. Well, what if, what if they never come? What if, what if they died? What if they're gone and they can never come and ask for forgiveness? Or, or what if they're out of your life? Or, or even worse, what if they don't care and they're, they'll never show that remorse? Then why, why would you let them control you? 
Why would you let them continue to dominate your thoughts, continue to dominate those parts in your mind, continue to be imprisoned within your own bitterness and in that own panic room? Again, remember, forgiveness is primarily for you to be free. Uh, The third reason is is they say, well, I'd be a hypocrite because I don't I don't feel like doing I don't feel like it'd be authentic. Well, remember, remember our definition of forgiveness. It's not based on what you feel. It's a it's a choice we make an act of our will to set that person free. But it but the other thing is that 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 reason doesn't actually make any sense because the reason is that I don't feel like it'd be authentic. I'd feel like a hypocrite. Well, a hypocrite is not when you do something against what you feel. A hypocrite is when you do something that's contrary to your nature. A, a hypocrite is when you do something that is is uh, in opposition to who you really are. And because of the cross, we've been made into a new creations. We're we've made in the image and the likeness of God. Meaning, your nature is to forgive. Your nature is compassion. Your nature is one of mercy. And to not forgive is actually hypocritical. It's hypocritical because it's against who you ultimately are. And so as partakers of divine nature, it's more natural for us to forgive, which is why there's freedom there. Because to do something unnatural puts you into that place of bondage. All right, the fourth reason that people don't want to forgive is they often feel like if, if I forgave them, I would be more vulnerable. I wouldn't be in control. And and the reality is that that controlling someone else through bitterness doesn't protect you from pain. It actually invites more pain and more destruction. That's what we saw again in Hebrews 12, 15, right? That you're missing out on experiencing the grace of God. You're you're missing out on on that peace and that joy. Sue talked about it this week in the in the community group about how you know she she likens it to a to a hose and that bitterness puts a kink in that hose preventing that life of Jesus from flowing and and the reality is I'm not supposed to be in control I'm not supposed to control anyone else I, I'm never in that control I'm to submit to Jesus and allow him to be the one that's in control. And so he's, he's inviting us now, he's leading us and instructing us to forgive so that we could experience that freedom and not let them control us through bitterness. And then the fifth reason that, that people don't forgive, and we talked about this a little bit last time as well, is that they've, they, people confuse forgiveness with reconciliation. That they're, they're thinking that if I forgive, then I have to be reconciled to them. And I don't, I'm not ready to, or I'm not willing to in some way. And we have to understand those are two different steps. That, that forgiveness has to happen before there can be any reconciliation. But forgiveness doesn't mean or guarantee reconciliation. Right? Reconciliation is the second step we take after forgiveness where that trust that was destroyed can be rebuilt. Where the relationship can be restored now. Uh, where we're, we're repairing the damage that was done. But, but the reality is that the bitterness that, that caused us to remain in that panic room behind those, those guarded walls and those, those thick bars, you know, only leads to greater mistrust, greater emptiness, greater loneliness, greater pain and greater bondage. So, so why we forgive is so that we can be free. And that, that's the important thing that we need to remember. All right. The the next W we want to look at is is where. And that one's easy. It's it's really it's anywhere. <laughs> you know, anywhere is great. You know, right here, right now, it's just sort of like, you know, it doesn't matter where you do it. But sometimes it's helpful to to have a friend there. To to do it, you know, with someone else. Uh and maybe maybe you need a counselor uh or or maybe one of us is elders. We would love to help you kind of walk through that. And, and so we're happy to, to do that. And so anywhere is, is a great place, whether it be in a bedroom, in a closet, you know, on a walk, um, you know, wherever you can, that's, that's the place to do it. Uh, but the next one, the next W that we want to look at is the who. Who do we forgive? And, and this one's a big one. So I, I tell people what you do is you, you, you begin to sit down with the Holy Spirit and make a list. 
make a list of inviting him to bring to your mind all the people that you that you need to forgive, the people that you've been harboring bitterness to. And and so here's some some obvious ones that would come to mind. I suspect would be people like like Wayne Gretzky and Carrie Frazier, because of what happened in 1993 in the Stanley Cup semifinals in Game Six in L.A. between Toronto and L.A., where Gretzky high stick Gilmore, but Carrie Frazier didn't call a penalty, and so Gilmore didn't you know the Leafs didn't get a power play. They end up losing the series and don't go off to the Stanley Cup, where they would clearly would have beaten the Montreal Canadiens. Everyone knows that. And robbing the Leafs of Stanley Cup in my lifetime. I mean, that's 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 the obvious one that goes on the list, clearly. But uh, some more serious examples, though, would include people like your your parents, maybe uh, siblings, uh, friends growing up, um, maybe past romantic relationships. Um, the bullies who terrorized you, maybe maybe some teachers who embarrassed you, um, maybe some former bosses who mistreated you or fired you and let you go, uh, maybe your spouse, um, uh, maybe your pastor, uh, maybe me, um, all kinds of different people. The, the, the important thing is we, we invite Jesus to show us who these people are. As a, as a passage in Hebrews 12, 15 says, looking diligently. Uh, looking deeply, going beneath the obvious in the surface, that God will bring some people to your mind to put on that list. Uh, a big one, though, that that I actually encourage most people, I always ask people about on their list when they bring it back to me, is is yourself. Are, are you on that list? And I, I've heard some people argue about, well, it's not biblical. The Bible never talks about forgiving yourself. We're only to forgive other people. Well, think about that, though. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness, again, is to send away a debt, to release another of the debt they owe that they owe us. And, and the reality is the person who, who has hurt us the most often is ourself, based on the choices we've made. Uh, to uh, whether it be our life choices or the or the, the sins we've done, uh, or or often even just embracing the level and the kind of self talk that we hear, the accusations of of a, attacking ourselves that really ultimately are coming from the flesh, but that we have allowed to attack us with. You know, though those just accepting those voices and 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 not not um not rejecting those thoughts has caused great damage to ourselves. And, and so often we're the ones that, that we need to forgive ourselves for because we've, we've become embittered towards ourselves. And, and understand this. This is, this is really, really important that whoever we're bitter towards, they become a bit of a monster in our minds. And that, that justifies our bitterness. It justifies our anger and it justifies the hate we have. So, so we see that, you know, in our, in our world today and, and all the, the animosity and all the turmoil that's happening between left and right and, and, and politically and, 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 and the different groups and so forth is there's a demonization happening of the other side. The other side becomes a monster and it allows us, it justifies our hate towards that group or that person. Well, when you're bitter towards yourself, you become your own monster. You, you, you are filled with such self-loathing, self, so, so much self-hatred that, <clears throat> that you are deserving of that pain and that punishment. That, that you are unworthy of any kind of love and, and never mind forgiveness and acceptance. You just, you're just so, so bad and evil. And, and therefore, it's, it's so difficult to offer yourself any kind of love. And yet we are told, we are instructed to love ourselves. And so it's really important that we recognize the bitterness we carry to our, towards ourselves so that we can forgive ourselves and properly see who we are. Because again, this is really important. When, when we don't forgive ourselves, when we're bitter towards ourselves, you don't see who you really are. You see a monster version of yourself. Well, the other one that I think belongs on our list for a lot of people is, is God. And, and again, you know, how, people ask, well, how can, how can God need forgiveness? Because 
Because to forgive God would somehow imply that God has done something wrong, that, that God has sinned. And, and that's true. God has not sinned. God is, God is perfect. He has never made a wrong choice. Uh, we may not always like the choices, but he's never sinned. He's never made a bad step. But again, what is forgiveness? Forgiveness is, is releasing a debt that another owes us. And, and the reality is <clears throat> we go through life and, and God will at some point disappoint you. At some point, he will fail to measure up to your expectations. Because think about it. I mean, the Bible talks about that everything happens according to his counsel. It doesn't mean that he's causing everything. But, but he, he has definitely got a plan for everything, which means that he hasn't stopped all that's going on. So, so think about your life right now and the struggles you're going through, maybe with, with COVID or at work or your family or, or health issues. And, 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 you know, the truth is God could snap his fingers and stop all of it, but he hasn't. He hasn't because he got a plan and that plan is unfolding according to his plan as he sees fit. But it means that you and I will experience suffering and pain as a result. And so will, will we forgive God for not measuring up to our expectations? And, and the reason is if we don't, then we harbor that bitterness towards God. now. And again, whoever you're bitter towards, remember, we, we carry that bitterness into a point where they become a monster. So now, now our concept of God becomes twisted. And, and we have God as a monster now. Well, if you got God as a tyrant, God as a monster, then how much intimacy are you going to have with him? You're going to want nothing to do with him at all. You're going to want to, to stay in that panic room, protected yourself from God and not wanting to trust him, never wanting him to get close to you. And so it, it distorts and it twists how we see him. And so it's important for us to release that debt that we believe God owes us. Again, it's not acknowledging, you know, that God's done some kind of a sin. It's us accepting the story that God's authored for our lives. And so I think he's an important person to, to consider putting on that list. The, the most important thing that you, we, we need to remember here is we don't edit the list. Whoever the Holy Spirit has brought to your mind to put on that list, that's the name you write, it, you write down regardless. And, and some people say, well, you know, that, that, that happened such a long time ago and I already forgave them. They don't, they don't need to be on that list. Put them down anyways. Again, if God's bringing them to your mind, he's brought them to your mind for a reason. And, and the reality is that, that it's not to negate or diminish the forgiveness you did previously, but maybe there's more. Maybe, maybe there's, there's something else that we haven't recognized that we do need to forgive. And, and we're just discovering it. So, so that forgiveness you did earlier mattered, but we're just seeing that there's more to the debt and we're just discovering that now. <clears throat> so again, don't edit the list. Whoever God brings to mind, you put them down. Well, that, that leads us then to the next W, which is what? Understanding what is it that we're going to forgive. So here's what we do is we go back to that list of all the names that we put down there. And beside each name, you now list what they did to you. And again, God's going to bring to your mind the important things. How did they offend you? So, so let me give you an example. Um, imagine Josh, he breaks into my house and, and robs from me, right? So the who is Josh. I'd write Josh down. And then the what beside that would be he robbed me. He, he, he stole from me. But it's not enough to stop there. And, and I think this is where most people stop. They would say, Josh, he broke into my house and he robbed me. So I forgive Josh of robbing me. But <clears throat> the problem is I don't know the cost. I don't know the impact. I don't know what he took from me. So therefore, how can I forgive? Because if he, take, if he took $5 from me or if he took $5,000 from me, that's a big difference. And if I don't know what he took, then what is it that I'm forgiving? What's the debt that I'm releasing him? You see, in, in order to release the debt, I need to know and understand the debt. And this is the hard step because we're so, we're so accustomed to ignoring the cost or to minimizing the cost or justifying the cost 
or or rationalizing the cost to to bring it down to a manageable number that I I don't have to look at it. It can be in my periphery view now and I I can ignore it. And and the reality is I need to understand it. So so I would need to in this example here if Josh, if Josh has robbed me and and he's stolen from me then I I need to do an inventory. I need to find out that oh he, he took his he took our TV and and he, he's taken some of of Joy's jewelry and he's he's taken some of her crafting supplies which that was a bad move on your part Josh because Joy's going to get you now but um, she'll hunt you down for that for that yarn but uh, he, he's taken some money maybe as well or some some family heirlooms but basically we would we'd add it all up and say he took ten thousand dollars. Nine thousand of that would be the crafting supplies, obviously. But, but that ten thousand dollar total that he's taken for us means that that's how much he owes us. That because of his actions, the debt he owes us is equal to ten thousand dollars. Now that's a a simple example in in kind of financial terms. Well, what does that mean on a heart level? Well, <clears throat> imagine that that rather than robbing from me, Josh bullies me. And becomes a, a a bit of a tyrant, a bit of a bully towards me. So the who is Josh, the what is he bullied me, but the cost is, the impact is, how did it make how did it leave me feeling? And so his his bullying would have impacted me in a way that I I feel now insignificant. I feel I feel disrespected. I feel weak. I feel vulnerable. I feel beat up. I feel unloved and rejected by Josh. And and so now I feel great shame because of that weakness. I feel unacceptable. I feel alone. I don't belong. I feel worthless and insignificant. That's what he's taken from me. And that's the debt he owes me. He owes me that love and he owes me that acceptance and that self-worth. And, and that's what he's taken from me. And, and that that last part of the impact is so critical and it's so hard to see because it it takes takes something that we've buried or we've ignored and it, it means bringing it up close now so we see it right in front of our face and we study it and we have to we have to acknowledge that this hurt and it hurt in this way and it cut me deeply. The next W is when, when we forgive. And, and that, that happens only after you understand that cost. If you don't understand the cost, then you're not ready to forgive. But once you understand it, once you know the impact and, and you've kind of made that list of the, you know, the who, the what, and the cost, now you're ready. Now you're ready to forgive. And, and that, that brings us to then the biggest question, the H, how? How do I forgive? And, and it's really, really important for us to understand it because, because if we don't know how we do it, then it's impossible. And, and, you know, I've heard things, well, you write a letter to that person and, and, you know, either you can, uh, maybe you burn the letter afterwards or you, you bury the letter. Um, people say, well, you imagine the other person, the offender in a chair and you have a conversation with them, or if it's with yourself, maybe you go talk to yourself in the mirror, um, I've heard people talk about you, you take a hot air balloon or a helium balloon and you, you write, you know, that person's name on the balloon and go out to a high hill and, and release the balloon out into nature. That may not be environmentally friendly, but you kind of watch the, the balloon go away and, and so forth. And, and those might be helpful exercises, but that's not what forgiveness is. That's not how we forgive. It's not the mechanics of it. And it's important that we understand that because you see, I've heard a lot of messages on why we should forgive and the command that we're given to forgive. But when it comes to the how, we're just told to do it. Just just do it. And and the reality is you might as well tell me, you know, you know, here's a junkyard, go build a scrapyard, or out of the scrapyard to the junkyard, go build a spaceship with your pocket knife. Just just do it. You know, that that that's great. You've given a command, but it's an impossible command. But fortunately, Father's Word tells us not just why, not just when and where and, and so forth, but it actually instructs us on how. It teaches us how. 
So <clears throat> we're going to figure that out, and we're going to go back to that passage that we read earlier, Ephesians chapter 4, in verses 31 and 32. And in there, we're going to see the how. So verse 31, again, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ has forgiven you. The word here forgive actually literally means showing grace to one another. I think it's been a, a translated properly, though, to, to have that idea of forgiveness, because I think that's essentially what Paul's getting at here. But we're to show compassion, we're to show grace, we're to show mercy, specifically by forgiving those who've hurt us. Just as. Now, now just as is more than because. See, please understand, verse 32 is not a reason to forgive. That was Matthew 18. The reason to forgive is because we've been forgiven. You know, Hebrews 12, 15, the reason to forgive is so that you could be free, so that bitterness wouldn't control you. Proverbs 14, 30, so that you could have a tranquil heart and your body could be at rest, could be healed, right? So there's, there's reasons to forgive, but that's not what verse 32 is telling us. Verse 32 is giving us a method. It's telling us how. You see, the words just as could be could be translated in a different way. It could be translated as in the same way or in the same manner. See, what Paul's saying is that we're to forgive one another in the same way, in the same manner, just as God in Christ forgave you and I. Which means that if I could understand how God forgave me, I can now apply that in forgiving someone else. So, so let's kind of understand it from that perspective. Let's kind of break it down and understand how did God forgive you and me, All right? So let's understand it this way, that, that between the relationship between you and God, between me and God, um, you know, I am the transgressor and he's the transgressed. I, I'm the offender and he's the one that's been offended. And because of my sin against him, there's now this barrier. There's now this, this divide between us. My sin stands between me and God, between you and I having a relationship, or between God and I having a relationship. Now, can God simply ignore my sins to have that relationship with me? No. For him to ignore my sins in that way means that he's no longer holy and just and perfect and true. But to to remain, have those sins remain, means that he's prevented from showing love and mercy towards me. So all that is to say is that God has to deal with my sin in some way. He can't ignore it. He, he can't, can't just wish it away. But Hebrews 9 and 22 says this. It says, according to the law, one must one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood and without shedding of blood. There is no forgiveness. See, there has to be a sacrifice. Blood has to be shed in order for there to be forgiveness. And so God can't just ignore my sins. There needs to be a sacrifice for my sins. Well, well, what's the sacrifice? Well, really, it's who? See, it's not, it's not a goat. It's not a lamb. It's not a pigeon or, or a turkey or whatever you've got. There's only one person that can pay for my sins. And that's, that's the Lamb of God. That's, that's Jesus himself. And so we have a verse like First John 2 and verse 2 where it says that Jesus himself is our propitiation. That, that's just a fancy word for meaning a wrath-averting sacrifice. It, that Jesus is the sacrifice for my sins. And, and, and so what is forgiveness now? Forgiveness is, is then God agreeing that Jesus has paid my debt. That God agrees that that Jesus' sacrifice on that cross is enough to pay all the debt that I owed God. And therefore, God releases me of that debt because he's been paid in full by Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. Forgiveness is, is God agreeing that Jesus paid for my debt, which allows him to forgive me, to release me of the debt, so I owe him nothing anymore. 
So, so think about it this way. Imagine now I, I pass and I, I go to the edge of heaven at the pearly gates where there's Peter and God, right? As every joke tells us, right? So there's Peter and God and, and I'm about to enter into heaven and God says, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Ross. I, I know that you stole that, that Cadbury, you know, caramel milk or that arrow bar when you were six years old. And because of that, that sin, I can't let you in. Well, what would Jesus say? Jesus would be right there and he'd say, no, no, I paid for that one. And God would say, oh, I know that. Come on in. Because the reality is every single one of my sins, little, big, enormous, God's forgiven me of it because of the sacrifice of what Jesus has done on the cross. Hopefully that's making sense because now we want to apply that. In the same way, just as God in Christ, God, because of what Christ did on the cross and his work, God forgave us in the same way, we're going to forgive other people. So, so let's apply it then, right? So now let's think of it this way. I'm the one that's been offended. I'm the one that's been transgressed. And, and we're going to use again, Josh is my, we're picking on Josh this morning, but Josh is my offender. He's transgressed against me. He's, he's stolen from me. Well, how how do I forgive him? Well, if God himself can't ignore sin, then what hope do I have? I can't do it either. That's why we don't minimize, we don't rationalize, we don't justify, we don't try to excuse it and just ignore it or bury it. We have to deal with it. And again, Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, without a sacrifice, there can be no forgiveness of sins. So we need a sacrifice. Someone has to die. And, and John, I'm sorry, but it's going to be you. No, it's not John. Who's our sacrifice? It's Jesus. You see, again, 1 John 2, 2 says that Jesus is the propitiation, the sacrifice, not just for my sins, not just for your sins, but the sins of the whole world. Meaning that Jesus died for Josh's sins against me. Uh, friends, I hope you're seeing it. I hope you're seeing this, guys, that, that you see the freedom that this means, that, that that debt has been paid for by Jesus himself. And, and forgiveness then is the act of me agreeing with that, agreeing that Jesus paid Josh's debt against me so he doesn't owe me anymore because Jesus has made me whole. Jesus has paid that debt. So, so do, do, do you see the power in that? Because there, there's two things. Number one is, is the heavy lifting and all that's been done by Jesus now. That, he, that there's something that I'm pointing to that's beyond what's happening in my own soul. I'm, I get to point to the cross. Uh, it's something that I can look to and say, because of the cross, I can now choose to forgive. But number two is that, that that debt is paid because I get to receive it from Jesus. You see, you think about it, that as long as I'm holding on to the debt, I can't receive from God. I can't receive from Jesus. I got to first let go of that debt, put that debt down in order to receive from him. And that's all he's waiting for, is for me to forgive someone else's debt so I can receive from him. So, So think about it this way. Again, using that example of being bullied growing up, right? Again, the cost is to our our self-worth, our self-image. We we might begin to feel um, low self-esteem and and not any any self-respect. We're owed that acceptance. We're owed that love. We're owed that belonging and that worth. And if if I'm demanding it from my bully, I may never get it. But if I forgive my bully, I'm laying down that debt recognizing that Jesus has paid it and therefore I can receive from Jesus what was taken from me. I can receive from him that self-respect. I can receive from him that love and that worth and that, that acceptance. I can receive from him that voice as he takes away that shame and that fear and insecurity. That's what, I, that's what happens and there's a healing that comes now from that. Or, or maybe you're abused as a child. And and that abuser now has taken away your purity, taken away your self-worth, taken away your voice and left you with that shame and fear. 
And God says, will you forgive them? Allowing me to restore to you what was taken. Release that abuser, not because they deserve it, not because they've earned it, not because they're remorseful in any way, but so that you can be free. So you can be free to receive from me what was taken. There's just such incredible freedom that comes from that. So I want, I want to close by, by telling you a story. And, and I've got Joy's permission to tell, tell you it's her story, really. And I, um, I can still remember the day and see it even right now in my mind's eye, the day that this clicked for her, when she understood the forgiveness. Because when, when she was a little girl, she was, she was sexually abused by a, a close family friend. And, and that, that left a deep scar and a deep wound in her. And, and she spent most of her, her childhood growing up wanting to forgive this man because that was the right thing to do. That's what she was taught. That to be a good Christian, you have to forgive. And, and that was her motivation. Not, not, not a healthy motivation, but that was her motivation. And, and so she kept wanting to forgive, but always questioning, am I doing it right? Because she would hear things such as, well, if you've forgiven, then you shouldn't feel anger towards a person. Or you shouldn't feel any hurt anymore. But she would still struggle with it and then begin to quit. Well, maybe I didn't do it right. Which means that I'm a bad Christian now. So it even is worse upon that. And so there's all this struggle in this about wanting to forgive, but struggling to forgive. Or did I do it right? If I did it right, why do I still remember? Why do I still have thoughts about it? And so there's all this condemnation until she heard and discovered that she can forgive just as in the same way that God forgave her, meaning that Jesus paid the debt. Jesus took this man's sin upon himself on the cross. And and when she saw that, I can remember looking in her her eyes, she's sitting in this chair and and she had tears running down each side of her, her face. And she said these words, and I'll never forget. She says, he's forgiven, and I'm free. I'm free. I'm free from him. He doesn't control me anymore. I'm free to receive what he took from me. And that's that's the beauty, and that's the power of forgiveness. And it, it really doesn't matter what this guy is at and where, where his heart's at. She's now free. And, and that's the invitation that I think God's given each and every one of us. To forgive those who've hurt us so that we can be free to walk out of that panic room. Forgive our abusers. Forgive our parents. Forgive our siblings, our friends, our teachers, our spouses our enemies, forgive ourselves. And yeah, even forgive God, release the debt we, th- we think God owes us so we can walk out of that panic room, walk out of that prison of bitterness and experience life, experience wholeness and healing. So let me, let me give you some homework then. If you're sitting here and, and beginning to have a list of names of people and, and events flash through your mind, and here's your homework. Write it down. Make a list. I, I find it's helpful to make three columns. You know, column one is the who. Column two is the what they did. And the most important column is column three. What was the cost? What was the impact? How did it leave you feeling? And make that list. Again, letting God bring those those people to your mind. Don't edit that list. And whether you you write a letter, whether you, you do the balloon thing or you, you, you sit with a friend or have an empty chair or meet with a counselor or, or one of us as elders, but then pray through that name, pray through that list of hurts and, and say, it's, don't say I want to forgive or Lord help me to forgive because neither is that is actually doing it, right? It's, it's a choice we make and say, Lord, I choose to forgive Josh. I choose to forgive my mom, my dad, so-and-so. I choose to forgive myself. And I choose now to receive from you what was taken and invite Jesus to show you how he's paid that debt so that you can be free. Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, we, um, we thank you for the freedom that you've offered to us. We thank you that what you have done on the cross has made it possible for us to walk in freedom so that we don't have to stay in our panic room. We don't have to have this distorted view of you, of ourselves, of other people, that we can be free. I pray, Father, that each of us could, could just imagine a world where forgiveness happened, where we wouldn't be controlled by this anger. We wouldn't be controlled by, by this vengeance and this malice, that we'd be free to show compassion and mercy in other people. And, and the impact that would have on, on our own hearts, on our own bodies, on our families, in our communities, and maybe even in our culture and our nation. So I thank you, Father, for what you're going to do in, in the days and weeks ahead as you continue to bring to our mind what we've heard this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.